Welcome to Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with artists, activists, and authors during this ongoing new wave of the COVID pandemic. I'm one of your co-hosts this evening, Joe Ramsey, live streaming, Zoom casting, Facebook live streaming with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts on the south side of Boston. And I'm very pleased to be joined by a very special co-host and co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity, Lena Durkin. Lena, great to have you with me this evening. Hey Joe, thank you. Um, my name is Lena Durkin. I'm Zooming in from Marshfield, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm so excited to have Jeremy Brecker with us on the show tonight. How are you doing, Jeremy? Good, great to be here with all of you. Yeah, Jeremy, we are really excited to have you with us. This is one of the times uh, on Shelter and Solidarity where a thinker I was not that familiar with. Uh, I've had the chance to read some of your work before this conversation. I'm really excited about the many layers of the, the theory and practice and the, or as you put it, the toolkit that you bring to the current environment that we're in. Um, yeah, so uh, just again, thank you for being here. Awesome. So for those joining us that aren't familiar with Jeremy and his work, I'll just give a quick interdu introduction here. Um, so Jeremy Brecker has been an, an activist and participant in various social movements since the 1960s, ranging from the movement for nuclear disarmament, civil rights, the anti-war and peace movement, international labor rights and global economic justice, accountability for war crimes, climate protection, and many others. He is the author of 15 books on labor and social movements, and he has also received five regional Emmy Awards for his documentary film work. Um, he is currently the policy and research director of the Labor Network for Sustainability. Um, and today we're going to be discussing his most recent publication, which is um, his book titled Common Preservation in a Time of Mutual Destruction. So I will hand it back over to Joe to do a little introduction of the book and then get started with our questions. Thank you so much, Lena. And uh, Jeremy will be coming to you in just a moment. But before we do so, we wanted to uh, give a special shout out and thanks to PM Press, the publisher of Jeremy's most recent book, Common Preservation, uh, and thank them for co-sponsoring uh, this event. And hopefully we'll have a chance to chat with some of the PM Press folks. If you're out there a little bit later in the show when we come to the Q&A, as we always do somewhere around the hour mark. So those of you who are joining us or in the audience on or on Facebook, please, if you do have a question or comment that you'd like to make for Jeremy or for the broader discussion, feel free to use that chat box and we will circle back to you around 45 minutes in. We'll remind you of that and make sure to open things up. But first, I just wanted to start with, start with just a an excerpt from the, the blurb, one of the press blurbs from PM Press regarding this exciting book, Common Preservation in a Time of Mutual Destruction. And so here I read before I ask a question. Uh, as world leaders eschew co cooperation to address climate change, nuclear proliferation, economic meltdown, and other threats to our survival, more and more people experience a pervasive sense of dread and despair. Is there anything we can do? What can put us on the course from mutual destruction to common preservation? In the past, social movements have sometimes made rapid and unexpected changes that countered apparently incurable social problems. In the book, Common Preservation, Jeremy Brecker shares his experiences and what he has learned that can help ward off mutual destruction and provides a unique heuristic, a toolkit for thinkers and activists to understand and create new forms of what he calls common preservation. Jeremy Brecker presents scores of historical examples of people who changed history by adopting strategies of common preservation, showing what we can learn from past social movements to better confront today's global threats of climate change, war, and economic chaos. Right, so that's from PM Press, and just gives you a little sense of the the, the ambition, uh, the scope, and the very timeliness. We might say the urgency of this book and the questions, the really terrific questions that it's raising, as well as answering. So, Jeremy, to you, my first question is: Assuming that our audience has not had a chance to read the book yet, could you please, in a few minutes, offer us what you see as the key arguments or key intervention of this book? As Lena mentioned, you've written as many as 15 other books. What's new and important about this one? Uh, what would you see as its relationship to your previous work? And essentially, how or why did you come to write the book? Uh, I know we have many questions to get to, so we're hoping you can give us the nutshell version and we will have a chance to dive in. Lena will be taking us into some of the applications of your theory uh, before I'll be looping in with some of the methodological questions a little later in the show. Jeremy, please give us a sense of this, this amazing book. Well, in a nutshell, 
uh, I started 50 years ago and more being concerned about nuclear war and about racism and a wide range of other issues that have started then and continued down to today with climate change uh, and uh, uh, how do you address the pandemic. Uh, and I have focused primarily on how ordinary folks get themselves together, organize themselves to be able to respond to the problems that they face, whether it's nuclear war, whether it's COVID, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, racial uh, oppression. Uh, and over the many years that I've been participating in those movements and also uh, studying them and writing about them, uh, I've come to see uh, of course, very great differences and specific character rooted in specific problems and exper historical experiences. But I've also come to see some common elements in the process by which people uh, address those problems and specifically how they get from responding to their problems, whatever they may be, completely on an individual basis to responding uh, collectively with some kind of collective action. And that's something that uh, uh, we don't think of it as something that we see every day. Some people even feel, oh, I can't, it doesn't happen, it can't happen. But in fact, uh, in this book I give, uh, as you mentioned, scores and scores of examples where that has happened and then try to delve into how that happens, how people move from seeing their problems as individual and trying to solve them as individuals to seeing them as something they share with other people and then uh, try to figure out from that, uh, how might they have more power to deal with their problems by cooperating with the other people who also share those problems. Uh, and then finally, uh, how do you make that effective? How do you, uh, how do people learn to move from uh, sort of bitching and moaning and complaining and uh, it's, uh, not effective ways of addressing their problems and getting the power to deal with them and learning from that what works and what doesn't work and then moving uh, to more effective means that really mobilize the power that they potentially have through collective action. Terrific. Lena? Yeah, so that's actually a perfect lead into my first question. Um, so picking up on this idea of how we can shift from um, self-preservation to collective and common preservation, um, what do you see as like the best specific strategies that we have to nurture common preservation in a society that's very much um, individualistic and more focused on that kind of self-preservation uh, mindset, um, while also simultaneously degrading values like community, <clears throat> um, solidarity, and collectivism. Um, and then also, what are some of the interstitial locations in the existing system um, that we can kind of take advantage of when we're, when we're trying to shift, um, to make that shift to common preservation? Well, you put your finger on the core problem. Uh, and it's no doubt true that in a capitalist society uh, and a society with traditions of political and social uh, and economic individualism, that these problems are made even worse. Uh, but they are ubiquitous problems that people are not born uh, cooperating and with communications about their problems all uh, worked out in advance and uh, no need to overcome their existing isolation uh, and sense of powerlessness. Uh, I think all of us all over the world uh, face those same problems uh, and have to figure out how to overcome them. Um, the uh, book is of course, devoted to looking at how that happens and looking at it in different situations and different versions of how it happens. Uh, but uh, I think a very important aspect is 
people come up against the fact that they can't solve the problems. And the, uh, it's not that they will have an instinct to want to cooperate, although there are certain things, certainly things in human life and human nature that lead toward cooperation or help make cooperation possible, just as there are things that uh, make it more difficult. But um, the, uh, when I look at the main historical examples that I know about, they really start from people having immense frustration with trying to solve their problems in, uh, by individual means. So uh, if you look at the origins of the women's movement, uh, women's liberation movement in the 1950s and 60s, there was a, a tremendous push for women to get education and be able to have uh, more fulfilling lives in a wider world, kind of, uh, social context. Uh, and essentially uh, it worked a little bit for some people, but for most people it didn't work and they remained locked in a uh, role of housewife, subor subordinate to men in all spheres of their lives. And uh, out of that frustration developed uh, the women's liberation movement. Uh, you can see very much the same thing with the rise of the civil rights movement, where there was decades uh, of attempt to uh, use the legal system as a means to challenge racism. And then also very strong uh, efforts for individual advancement um, to uh, escape the effects of racism by becoming educated, by becoming successful in careers. And there definitely were people who did that. And it was definitely uh, something that was courageous for the people who did it and definitely helped lay the groundwork for the rise of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. But it uh, was by and large not successful in overcoming the effects of racism on ordinary black folks. And uh, the frustration of that, the failure of those uh, efforts under most circumstances um, were uh, uh, met by people trying to figure out, well, what else can we do? What other alternatives do we have? And the militant civil rights phase of the black movement uh, grew in large part out of that frustration and that uh, desire for liberation that went beyond what could be offered by uh, a um, uh, legally based uh, challenge to racial oppression. And of course, these things are not really either ors. They, in, in all of the cases, the, what I've described as more individual uh, approaches contributed to laid some of the groundwork for, as well as providing some of the failures that led people to go beyond. So I think the broad answer to the question that you're raising, and as I say, the whole book is really an exploration of those questions, uh, but uh, the fact that frustration and failure is integral to how people learn and how they move to new things uh, and, and new strategies. Uh, and then along with that, testing new strategies, not assuming that the first idea that occurs to them is the thing that's going to be the solution to their problems, but rather when people think, well, maybe we should try to approach these problems collectively and through collective action, that's the beginning of a whole new process of learning and change through which people come to say, not only let's act collectively, but what can we learn from other people's experience and our experience about how to do that? Uh, and if I can just give one more example, uh, the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, position of uh, Blacks in the American South uh, in the period at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, where uh, Black enslaved 
uh, people were spread out all over um, uh, plantations and back in the back country uh, throughout the South and uh, didn't initially rise up and support the Union uh, forces or form their own organizations uh, to fight for, for their liberation. Uh, first they watched and then um, observed what was going on. And then as soon as it became clear that uh, the uh, Union Army would not turn them back over to their uh, masters uh, began coming to where the, the Union encampments were, started working for the Union Army, uh, eventually uh, were uh, actually able to become soldiers uh, and really fight for their own liberation. Um, but this happened through a whole process in which they gradually figured out and gradually uh, put the kinds of pressure that they needed to on the uh, uh, forces of the Union and the North and the military of the Union and the North to see that they could be the critical force uh, in uh, uh, abolishing slavery and winning the war uh, 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 and thereby abolishing slavery. Um, that whole process it took time, people had to figure it out, uh, but they did, and that became the basis also for a whole new thrust of Black liberation in the Reconstruction period that followed the war. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think another really valuable idea um, that you write about in your book when, about when it comes to building successful social movements is rethinking the the whole idea of power as being based really based in dependence um and that the powerful are really uh their power comes from dependence of the consent and obedience of the powerless or at least those who appear to be powerless um so how is reframing our understanding of power useful to reveal the potential power that we really do have through collective action um, and the collective withdrawal of our cooperation um, and how can that shift in understanding about the origins of power open up new opportunities for building social movements um, and more effective resistance? Absolutely central question. And a, a good deal of the book is devoted to this. Uh, and this way of thinking about power is really integral to the questions of uh that that joe raised at the beginning regarding systems theory and loops and some of the more arcane uh theoretical dimensions of this that we're going to get to um because uh the fundamental i maybe i should start by saying that the way i learned this uh and a great deal of what i've learned about this is from social movements that I've experienced and the history of social movements. And my first book was a book of, called Strike uh, that was the history of peak periods of working class struggle in the United States. And really it was from looking at that that I came to feel and understand uh, that the usual way of looking at power was uh, to say the least incomplete. Uh, and it really was the analysis of the labor movement going back into the 19th century and with many different organizations uh, and different uh, kinds of workers. But from the beginning, the idea of the strike was that um, workers may be dependent on their employers for a job, but employers, and they're individually dependent on their employers, but the employers are dependent on workers as a collective, as a group for everything they want, for make it, for producing anything and for uh, being, therefore being able to make their profits uh, and expand their wealth, which is the thing that they're really trying to do. And so 
if workers functioned collectively, uh, they therefore had a counter power uh, against the power of their employers uh, and of those political forces and to the National Guard and police and uh, army and all the other forms of uh, seeming power that are mobilized against them. Uh, and the key idea uh, uh, is that all those forms of power ultimately depend in the case of worker struggles, very much depend on uh, workers uh, and their willingness to obey orders and cooperate and do the work their employers expect them to do. Uh, one of my favorite formulations of this was a poem by uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, called uh, uh, A Worker's War Primer. Uh, and it said, uh, uh, boss, your worker is a, uh, 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 well, it starts, uh, your uh, uh, general, your airplane is a powerful uh, weapon. It can bomb and it can kill, uh, but it has one problem. It needs a pilot. And uh, then he goes through a litany of various other ways that the powerful are dependent uh, on the pilot, they're dependent on the tr uh, tank driver who drives the tank, and the employers are dependent on the workers uh, who, if they don't work, uh, then there's no ability of uh, um, employers to achieve their objectives. And the expansion of this concept uh, that I think is really critical um, uh, is usually traced and I think properly traced to Gandhi uh, who applied it to, to political life and to uh, imperialism and colonialism and the domination of one people by another uh, and uh, essentially said um, that uh, there is, uh, no matter, uh, in the case it was a, articulated in relation to British colonialism in India and saying there is, um, uh, there are vast armies, there are armies of bureaucrats and tax collectors, there is a legal system that can grab people and throw them in jail, and these seem to be the sources of power and be able to dominate uh, ordinary folks or people of, uh, who are being ruled by a colonial power. Uh, and we can see the same thing uh, within governments, whether they're authoritarian or democratic. Um, but the uh, uh, fact of the matter is that those powerful forces cannot do anything if uh, those who they depend on to follow their orders, uh, don't go along and don't acquiesce uh, or even resist. And so that fundamental concept uh, is, uh, I think, really uh, crucial for understanding how the world works, but especially for understanding how, I, it's what I call the power of the powerless. It's the fact that those who feel powerless uh, may not be through their own action or and or through the alliances that they can build, they can uh, uh, in fact be able to come, uh, counter the power of the powerful. And in terms of just to finish up with a question that you, I think, ended with, why does it matter uh, if people understand this? If people don't understand this, then what's the point of Resisting. What's the point of doing anything except just surrendering, surrendering in advance, and saying, "Well, they've got the guns, they've got the, the police forces, they've got the money, they've got the propaganda organs." Uh, excuse me, the news media, um, and uh, uh, what's the what's the point of resisting? And if people start from that assumption, then they never will test out 
what power they actually have. Whereas if, uh, and let's say use a fancy word, hypothesis, but it's a popular hypothesis is embedded in the way millions of people understand and see the world. And people test that hypothesis and try it and they get somewhere with it, but not all the way. And then think, okay, how could we do it better and make it even more effective? It's tremendously empowering for people to know that that potential power is there. It gives them the incentive to try to make that potential power real. So that's great. I want to ask a follow up, uh, Jeremy, on this on this issue of the hidden but but you know a realizable kind of power of the powerless or those who appear powerless when they are able to realize or come to realize that the power of the powerful actually depends on the quote unquote powerless right whether through and here i do want to mark distinctions uh, i'm paraphrasing you but you do kind of make a few distinctions here between uh, act kind of active cooperation which I, I suppose would be the example of you know the person in the tank or the bomber or the, the worker in the factory. Um, uh, also, however, you also mentioned consent and passive acquiescence. Uh, I want, so my follow-up was kind of to ask, see if you might say, I haven't yet got to a place in the book where you kind of parse these different um, kind of locations, these different kinds of, of like potentially powerful powerlessness, if you will, right? Latent power, unre unrealized power, alienated power, uh, to use a different set of terms. Uh, I wondered if you might step into kind of parsing a little bit how you think about those different moments. I, I think that your framework is useful for thinking about all three, but clearly like in the example of Gandhi, right? The, the idea of Indian um, so colonial subjects um, kind of getting their salt from the ocean instead of going through the colonial bureaucracy and taxation is a clear example. Workers going on strike is a clear example, but I wonder, and Lena's gonna take us into the climate crisis more explicitly from a labor standpoint with her next question, but what, you know, how you parse these different kinds of kind of cooperation and, and perhaps the different kind of tactics or strategies we can draw or that you can draw from your own activist organizing experience or from history for mediating, um, and kind of organizing through um, those different spaces. So again, just to repeat, like kind of active cooperation, consent, and kind of passive acquiescence. I wonder if you could help us think about those kind of three different aspects of this broader uh, framework of, of, of kind of politicizing or cooperation, right? Or, or, or turning cooperation into resistance. Thanks. So, uh... When I think about this, I usually start from concrete situations and concrete instances. That doesn't mean that there isn't a role, and I do try to do it, of comparing different situations. But if someone's trying to, the, the heuristic is in large part a way to take concrete situations that people face and tease out exactly the kind of question that you're asking, namely, what kind of counter power do people have? But it often depends on the specifics of the situation. I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, in the uh, uh, anti-apartheid movement, uh, uh, the, um, apart the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa uh, decided that they were going to make a lot of money and secure their financial basis by issuing, um, uh, I believe it was gold um, uh, coin, gold um, uh, money, uh, and then selling that uh, at an exorbitant price because it would be so valuable because it represented uh, the uh, might of the apartheid government. And so the uh, anti-apartheid movement worldwide latched onto that and said, this is a vulnerability. We have people who uh, hate and oppose uh, apartheid, but they don't really have any way to get a handle on it. I mean, they're not in South Africa, they're in Britain or the United States. Or, uh, but if we did a campaign against people buying the rand, and we use the kinds of power that we have. It's not just individual power. For example, uh, unions with substantial black membership had 
very substantial political power in uh, American cities. And so they became an important part of the campaign going to uh, major cities in the United States and using uh, political power um, uh, to get those uh, and moral suasion too, because a lot of people knew apartheid was wrong. Uh, so it was both uh, using their power, uh, their self-interested based power and their moral power to force major governments to uh, 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 refuse to buy these coins and divest themselves from other South African investments. And this actually had played a major role in the transformation, which of course was also based on the utilization of dependence in South Africa, especially with major, major strikes in the uh, uh, mining industry, which was the major cash cow for the regime. Uh, and those different forces combined were a substantial part of what eventually made uh, the apartheid regime decide that it had to re uh, release Nelson Mandela and enter negotiations for democratization of South Africa. So it, it wouldn't have happened that way if it hadn't been for the specific things that uh, the strategy that the regime was using and so I would say in very often um, uh, you have to do a close grained analysis of what are the vulnerabilities of the uh, 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 those you're trying to counter and create counterpower to. Um, so uh, within that, um, uh, let me also say that you find uh, a very extended and excellent uh, analysis of the different types of um, uh, collective action in terms of the question you're asking in Gene Sharp's uh, works on the power on nonviolent action. Uh, and in fact, he has a, a, a one volume of his three volume magnum opus that is on the uh, 198 forms of direct action, each of which is based on one or another kind of vulnerability uh, to withdrawal of support or uh, active uh, intervention uh, and interference. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, to, to, yeah, that's ahead. great. I mean, just to lift up and then kicking it over yeah. to Lena, I think for a great chance to apply some of these ideas. Um, but this issue of examining where the vulnerabilities are right, in a current system right. and thinking about, you know, the kind of power, so-called powerless, marginalized, oppressed people's relationship to them and thinking about where they could actually affect them, at least if, if they can bring themselves to collective action of some sort. I think that's really important, uh, thinking about different types of counterpower and the method of doing a fine grained analysis of kind of your the enemy or the other side's vulnerabilities. That seems very important. And I think it's a great transition for Lena's next question. Lena? Yeah, um, so like just said, I have a question about um, climate protection, which you go into detail about in the third part of your book um, and how you can apply your common preservation heuristic to um, climate, pre climate protection. Um, but I wanted to focus specifically on uh, what your thoughts are on some ways that organized labor um, has taken action on the climate front um, and ways that they might or should do more to take on climate change. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask if you could kind of elaborate on your proposed strategy of a global nonviolent climate insurgency um, and what that means, what that would look like, and also maybe what the role of labor might be in that in a in the shift to adopting that kind of a strategy to climate protection. One's up here. Okay. Um, so let me start with the labor question. And if I lose the thread of the second question, bring me back to it. Uh, so this is what I spend all day, every day doing. Uh, I, my uh, uh, work is with the Labor Network for Sustainability, 
uh, which is a organization that was created specifically to uh, help labor enter the fight around climate protection and climate change. Uh, and for the last 12 years, that's the main thing that I've been doing uh, with, with my political work and vocational work. Um, and uh, so again, I would say, as I said in the, uh, reflecting what I said to the last question, this is something uh, where this is an example of how you have to go and uh, go to a fine grained level and figure out what are the interests, what are the capabilities, what are the barriers in a concrete situation with a concrete set of constituencies. Um, and so the first thing we did uh, when we started the Labor Network for Sustainability was a major, uh, what we then called a power structure analysis of the labor movement on uh, climate issues. Uh, and then we did a follow-up that we call the labor landscape analysis, where we tried to look at each of about 50 unions uh, and other labor organizations and what were their interests, what had been their policies on climate, what were the, the subgroups within the union and what were their uh, uh, interests on both pro and con on climate protection um, and, uh, and take that as a starting point. And we also did a study uh, on how labor changes on major social issues where we looked at civil rights and gay rights and immigrant rights and uh, uh, war and military issues uh, and um, tried to understand the process by which these uh, were, uh, these changes were made. And I would say both of these very much reflect the what I call the common preservation heuristic. The heuristic is really a set of tools for going in and making that kind of analysis. Um, so, uh, uh, so with respect to organized labor, um, uh, as you can imagine, it has many uh, dimensions. And one of the first things we did was unpack the different set of interests and traditions within different unions. Um, and I don't want to do a complete analysis of that here, uh, but uh, to say that, but let me just give a couple of examples where they're very different. Uh, uh, workers in transit, uh, public transit, have been extremely strong advocates for climate protection. Um, and that is made up of several parts, but there's no, uh, form of investment in climate protecting uh, materials and activities uh, that's, that's more um, cost effective for reducing greenhouse gases than shifting to public transit. And there's lots of studies showing that. So they have a very direct positive self-interest in uh, in climate protection. They also have to breathe the damn stuff that comes out of the exhaust in their buses or their other trans uh, transit uh, uh, equipment. And so they have a very strong interest in electrifying transit and uh, otherwise uh, reducing the greenhouse gases that are emitted by uh, buses and subway cars and other transit uh, vehicles. So uh, that is a very direct um, uh, example of a self-interest side of this. Uh, that uh, and uh, when uh, we first started the Labor Network for Sustainability, uh, uh, our, our co-founder Joe Uline went to the Broadway uh, theater unions and said, how would you be affected by a uh, doubling or tripling of the number of floods in, uh, uh, on Broadway? And they said, gee, we never thought of that. We'd be wiped out. Um, something that has uh, certainly the negative effect on them has been very, uh, hurt them very much in the last decade or so, the superstorms. So, uh, but they hadn't even thought about it at that point uh, a dozen years ago. Um, 
but that would be another example of where the self-interest part comes in. Um, it's also true that uh, other parts of the labor movement have or, th or think they have a direct interest uh, on the opposite side. So especially some of the construction unions have been uh, very strong opponents of uh, climate protection policies um, uh, because they want to build nuclear power plants and they want to build um, uh, coal, conventional coal-fired power plants and they don't want to be uh, prevented from doing that and they want to build pipelines. In dealing with that, uh, a, a cru crucial point on the self-interest side is that for many, many of them, there actually would be more jobs available uh, with uh, making renewable energy and if investment was shifted from fossil fuel energy to renewable energy. So getting them, uh, encouraging them to understand that uh, and finding the groups within those unions who do understand it or who would most be benefited by that change uh, uh, is, another part of the piece of working within organized labor. Um, and then the uh, other part is um, uh, <laughs> workers are uh, human beings. Uh, it's something that's sometimes forgotten by when people look at this in some kind of crude self-interest political science kind of framework. But in fact, workers are just or more affected by kind of the threats of climate change, not only in a narrow self-interest way, which they are, and I didn't even mention the effects of storms and wildfires and other effects of climate change uh, on workers, which are devastating, which we've done a lot to document and uh, show those connections. But um, the uh, fact of the matter is, uh, we, I did a study with uh, a sociologist uh, which showed that union members are more concerned about climate change, more uh, in support of environmental uh, causes, and um, uh, more uh, uh, likely to be members of an environmental organization than the population as a whole or workers who are not union members. So, um, the fact uh, it's also central to say, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen don't, don't look up, but when people say don't look up or the equivalent for climate, you know, this is all a bunch of hogwash, it's not going to affect us, forget about it. To say, look up, look and see what's actually happening, look at that storm that happened in your neighborhood and shut your workplace for a month. Uh, that uh, uh, and look at what's happening to people in the country that you came from. Um, because we, actually there are a number of unions that have large immigrant populations that first became alerted to the climate issue and became climate advocates because of what was happening in the Philippines or other places that their uh, members had come from. So all of those bring together self-interest and a sense of collective interest. And that to me is the core of the idea of solidarity. And really, if you look at it, common preservation is almost uh, another word for solidarity. And the core of it is meeting our individual needs and interests by collaborating, working together, by solidarity, by common preservation. So that's yeah, what we're thank, trying to win. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. I, I, I hope to maybe be able to loop back to look up with the next question. But right now, I'm going to kind of signal a little bit of changing gears here um, while you get a drink of water. Um, you know, Lena's been leading in with some of the questions drawn from the reading of the third section of your book. I just like to offer the, you know, those who haven't had a chance to engage the text yet, a sense of its structure, right? It's clearly very clearly organized, many, many very short readable chapters kind of united around a clear concept or intervention. But the three sections, right, the kind of first part of the book is kind of like the process of how you developed this set of tools or this heuristic, as you talk about, you, use, you often speak of a kind of toolkit 
or a tool shed and and use that kind of language of of, of craftsmanship or craftspersonship. Um, and then the second part of the book is about like a description of the tools, what the tools are, right? And the third is a kind of application of the tools to the current climate crisis, the climate emergency, this climate insurgency. So I, I, you know, we divided labor. I started with the beginning of the book. Lena has been doing the later parts. I'm going to read the whole thing, but I've been really struck by the first part of the book and the attention you give, not only to your own process, kind of a little bit of kind of light intellectual political autobiography kind of woven into the discussion of case studies, but your real attention and your ex really um, foregrounding of how many different fields you pulled from, you call it kind of uh, like raiding parties, right? Um, you know, as opposed to just subscribing to one school of thought, you describe encounters with, and I'm here, I'm gonna list just a couple, you know, from psychology, child or human development, biology, physics, the early uh, breakthroughs of cybernetics before it became just so associated with computers, right? Cybernetic theory. You know, you, you really seriously engage in, in a very accessible way thoughts or, from Piaget, uh, from Dewey, the famous pragmatist, uh, as well as historians, and then this uh, Norbert Weiner or Wiener on cybernetics. So I, I want to ask you a broad question and then a follow up about cybernetic theory, and I'll set that up more in a moment. But I'd like to kind of ask you, how has reading and studying widely contributed to your own political and organizing sensibility? And it just seems to me such a, um, you're even just the last comment you made in answering uh, the, the previous question, that attention to process, right? Trying to think the process of an individual in relationship to the process of a collective, right? That rather than kind of opposing one to the other, right? And, and, and treating them more mechanically, it seems like you've been very attentive to serious thinkers in all kinds of realms of science and, and, and history that are thinking about process. And, and, and I think your book, I mean, spends you know 150 pages talking about the process by which you develop this theory. So clearly you have a lot to say about process. I wondered if you could unpack a little bit about that, but maybe bring out a little bit of a subtext too that might not be as explicit in the book about why you thought it was important. You're not just interesting, you know, which is certainly interesting, but important to kind of dwell on this question of process as well as to do it from while drawing on so many different traditions as well. So I, I just love to hear a little more about the traditions you've pulled from, and then I want to get a little more into cybernetics after that. Good. Well, um, the starting point, I think, of why I'm interested in process uh, is because we aren't where we need to be. Um, and so the question is not just where do we need to be, if where we need to be is someplace we have no idea how to get to, then we're still up the creek without a paddle. So my interest in process is basically, where's the paddle? How do we get a paddle that's going to get us to where we need to go? Um, and uh, that is, so it goes back to the fundamental, where my thinking usually starts, which is a problem. What's the problem? Problem that I got uh, embedded in early in my life was, well, we're all going to blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons. So the question is, what's the process by which you get to someplace else? And similarly with other social movements, uh, it's the, usually my thinking about it starts with a problem and then how do you get uh, beyond that. Uh, and I think that the question of many different, uh, the many different kinds of sources I draw on, um, and I hope that's not too much of a st stumbling block to people in, uh, in getting, uh, in, in making use of what I'm trying to do in the book. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that I, I believe that every single thinker and every single idea that I present in the early parts of the book uh, are essential to the, to the overall heuristic that I develop and the overall approach to addressing social problems that I develop. And that's the... Uh, um, uh, really, I, I tried to not put anything in that I didn't think was essential to where, where we were trying to get. And the same is true of 
how and why I explore, explored these. I was always, uh, certainly from the time I wrote Strike, but even before that, studying concrete social movements and trying to understand them and figure out what would make their strategies better. Uh, that was always at the core of where I, where I came from, where I was coming from and thinking about any of this. Uh, and the exploration of uh, intellectual uh, of thinkers, uh, whether it's someone like Marx, who was generally thought of as you know meat and potatoes for people who want to engage in social change, to people like Piaget, who are rarely thought of at all and often thought of it as irrelevant. And often people say to me, "Well, why are you bothering with that? You know, what's the use of that for the problems you're addressing?" But really, I got. Uh, in each case, it was because I, I, I had the scent, I had the, the, there's something there. Uh, maybe if I could find that, I could do a better job in understanding the things I'm trying to deal with. Uh, it's important to say that it is many times people who uh, present these kinds of, uh, let's say, theoretical, uh, frameworks uh, do say do so in a way that's extremely difficult to understand, and often they act as if, oh well, you can't understand anything about society and making social change unless you've studied Marx or unless you've studied Hegel or unless you've studied this one or that one. That's not where I come from at all. And I wrote fourteen books that were designed that anybody could read them that could read a newspaper. Uh, before I wrote one that has the, these kinds of theoretical uh, dimensions. And even here, I strove enormously to try to make some things that would be presentations that would be accessible uh, and understandable. But, yeah. um, uh, but uh, uh, core, uh, basically what I included are the things that I found if I left them out, the story wouldn't be complete. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any way we can do justice in, you know, the 90 minutes or two hours we'll have here tonight to this. But I just want to say, I, absolutely, I think that your treatment of the, each concept and each each thinker is is accessible, useful, relevant. Um, and I just and I, I'm, I'm tempted to just dive into a bunch of them. I'm not. But I'm just going to say, I think no one should should restrain from getting this book because it's going to be like, too much theory and not enough practice, absolutely not. I mean, you make a clear distinction between kind of the pragmatic kind of tool-based, you know, kind of practice-based approach versus this kind of theory that's up, that's kind of divorced from practice. And that's, I think that comes through in, in each individual uh, chapter I've read so far. So, you know, kudos for that. And, and I really appreciate it. Now, zooming in a little bit, right? And again, Prior to reading your book, if somebody said, look, cybernetic theories relevant to uh, radical politics, I would have probably like tuned out and, or, you know, though I'm even though I'm, a, you know, I, I'm OK with going down the theoretical rabbit hole from time to time. I was really struck in reading uh, this book, what you were kind of drawing out of cybernetic theory, which apparently has this whole history before it was so kind of rendered synonymous with computers. And this you, you talk about a cybernetic kind of theory of or approach to understanding change and agency and causality right and, and even power right and this and one of the core ideas that i took was on page 78 this idea that you reach a goal or a, a, and a way of conceiving of reaching a goal by progressively reducing what prevents it right which is interesting right uh, similarly you write that for cybernetic theory quote power results less from the ability to impose a result than from the ability to counter or remove resistances to it. So, and I think this is a very, I mean, subtle, again, just to, to read that first question again, right? The idea of thinking about cybernetic theory of social change that is oh, focuses on reaching a goal, not just by like li linearly tracking a path to it, right? Going straight for the goal, whatever that would mean, you know, the general strike, straight for the revolution, straight for the seizing of the, 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 the palace. I don't know if we can say White House anymore. Uh, and rather thinking reaching a goal by progressively reducing what prevents it, this kind of negation of the negation, although you don't, you tend to use dialectical kind of language. 
I think it's fascinating. And it seemed to me actually very much an example of theory that's not like abstract, but it's very potentially very liberating in the sense of like when you're in a position, like you were saying earlier, climate crisis or atomized labor movement, how do we get to the place we need to be? That may be very difficult to imagine, but it's not difficult, at least for me, and I think for most people that are embodied in these structures and struggles, to, to, to come up with a whole list of things that stand in the way, like a whole bunch of things that are kind of incompatible with, right, with uh, that goal. And so, I don't know, I was very struck by your your use of cybernetic theory or early cybernetic kind of concepts in that way. And also, and I won't say, I, I won't ra ramble on here, but just to say also this notion of the feedback loop. And I guess if I had asked you two questions would be to, if you could elaborate a little more, maybe with examples or even contemporary applications around the climate crisis, since I'm sure people have come to this Zoom with that most on their mind, perhaps, though you've worked on so many other realms, peace, social justice, et cetera. Um, but uh, I'd like to hear more about your general thoughts on the application of the cybernetic concepts, but also this specifically this question of the feedback loop or the positive feedback loop. And I, and I guess here, and I'm sorry to give you two big questions at once, but I'll just get it done and then you can go and then we'll start bringing in our audience soon. So please y'all chime in in the, in the chat box when you're ready. But I guess, and this is where the look up connection comes in because look up if any, or don't look up, it's all about right in some ways, or about like all the bad feedback loops that exist in our society that can compel people to like not, to kind of not engage the real problem. And so I guess my question to reading your book so far about halfway through it now is like, who's, who's gonna maintain the circuit? Like, isn't, is, I mean, what, you know, is, is the circuit, the, feed, the positive feedback loop, something you see is like emerging primarily just through like organic practice? Or do you think that, that activists, obviously you write a book like this they have to be self-conscious about like, how are we going to create feedback loops between struggles so that we learn the lessons, positive and negative, and you don't just have like whole struggles erased from popular consciousness. So anyway, I guess one question about cybernetic theory as a, and then, and then if you want to address this question of the challenges of like applying, like creating, or how you think about this notion of feedback loops, positive or negative. I mean, that, the negative is my, my add, add on here after that movie, don't look up, which is all, and I think about Facebook, I think about all these corporate feedback loops that people are embedded in, right, that, that feed them something, but it's not actually what, you know, maybe uh, we need to be fed. So anyway, uh, that's a lot for you to, to pull from, but uh, we'll do that, and then we're going to start bringing in uh, Q&A, so uh, thank you, Jeremy. Well, let me start with the second question on feedback loops, and if we don't get back to the first one, bring me back to it, because it's a, it's a <laughs> very good and important question. Um, but let me start with the feedback loops. Uh, feedback is something that is so ubiquitous in the way people talk about things these days and, uh, that it's hard to even believe that although there has been analysis of specific forms of feedback going back to Aristotle and Greek times and uh, probably people everywhere in the world came up with some, um, some version of a thing where you did something and then you found out the result and you then you modified what you did on the basis of that result. But um, the uh, uh, in, in fact, the idea of feedback as a whole type of thing that might be applied to what a social movement does, that might be applied to a steam engine, that might be applied to um, uh, the regulation to a thermostat, which is a type, very simple type of feedback device, is really quite a new idea. And it does come from from uh, Norbert Wiener and um, uh, and the attempt to make uh, uh, rockets that would track down an airplane and blow it up. Uh, I'm happy to say that the guy who invented it decided after the nuclear weapons. Uh, that he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And he changed over to trying to uh, use his technique for creating prosthetic devices for people who had been, uh, had their limbs destroyed in war. Uh, and uh, uh, a, uh, a uh, uh, soars into plowshares model that uh, I think we can do with a lot of our technology. 
Um, but the basic uh, thing that, uh, well, one of the people who used uh, the idea of feedback, in fact, he had his own version of it before Weiner was Jean Piaget, who is, you say, I've drawn a lot on in my thinking. Uh, and there are a couple of ways that he uses the feedback idea that I picked up on to talk about social movements and social change. One is how do people uh, start out, you know, kids start out, they do parallel play. They put a, some kids together and they don't, they may have noticed that the other kid is doing something, but they don't cooperate. They might even imitate, but they don't cooperate. They don't say, send a signal saying, okay, you put the, you hold the block here and I'll put the other block on top of it. And as we go along as human beings, we gradually develop uh, the uh, kind of cooperation um, that goes beyond that kind of parallel play and is based on our being taking in what the other person is doing and think and constructing what they seem to have in their minds and then conveying what we're doing and what we are uh, doing in our mind and they try to see if they can get a handle on that and through that coming through a kind of cooperation. So that, and that's based on feedback because you do the, for example, you, uh, uh, if you hold the, one kid holds the block and the other one puts the block, another block on top of it, and then they take their hands off and the blocks stay up. They've gotten a strong message that, hey, this technique works, we can do this. And they can do it with another set of blocks or do it with whatever they want to do. They can go out to the playground and do it with uh, uh, rocks um, and expand, you know, expand the idea of how to do it with that. In my case, I even use it to explain how people, first of all, uh, who are isolated, come together and learn how to cooperate and see that they have things in common and know how to operate, act on those. That is, in my by the way of looking at it, is basically based on feedback. It's basically based on a cybernetic concept. Um, and uh, obviously it gets more sophisticated, especially gets more sophisticated when you can have complicated systems of representation like language uh, and where you can do more complicated things that you just do in your mind and you don't have to do with the real blocks. You can just imagine what would happen if you did do it with the blocks. But the basic idea of uh, let's take our, our past activity, our past way of doing things, the patterns that we have, let's try them out. Let's see where whether the result is what we want or not. And if the result isn't what we want, then we try to do something else and modify it in one way or another. And the modification that we need to make is one that will close that gap, that will uh, fill in the thing where we're, that we're missing in trying to achieve it. Uh, and I would say the examples I gave at the beginning of the women's movement and the civil rights movement uh, would be very good examples of the way I think about this, that uh, trying to get a good education and have individual advancement, uh, uh, actually both for women and for African-Americans had some gains and worked to a certain extent, but not in a way that would overcome the extreme oppression and, and uh, uh, limitation on uh, ability to get what you want and need uh, that those groups faced. And therefore, they began looking around for something that would close that gap. And that's where both the women's movement and the civil rights movement came from, was from the frustration and the reality of the gap. And then seeing what that you got through, the feed, that, that's the feedback, is, uh, is what you're trying to do isn't working. And then, well, let's see if we can imagine or put together or uh, create something else and then doing that and testing that and seeing, well, does that work better? So the cybernetic feedback loop model is a very, uh, dare I say, abstract, but very, I think very intuitive uh, way of understanding those kinds of processes. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it, it may sound a little heady to folks who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I, I, I really do promise you that it is, is really relevant and, uh, and applied and, and carefully and accessibly done. And uh, I know I think there's a longer conversation here on this topic, but I'm going to let, let us open some space here. So we're going to get some feedback from the 40 odd people that have been in and out. I think we have now 37 people here uh, live on the Zoom, and we'd love to get some feedback uh, and some case studies and questions and comments uh, for Jeremy Brecker here. Uh, if you, people want to indicate in the chat box or, or raising a hand, probably best if you put it in the chat box first. Uh, actually, Lena, I'll go to you. Do you have a follow-up or something you'd like to ask before we go to Q&A? I see Saran has added a question. I know that our co-producer Saran and, and Mark Soderstrom will have questions for us uh, momentarily, if not already. Uh, Lena, did you want to ask something before we uh, go to Q&A? Um... No, I didn't have anything to ask. I, I do have a question from Tim Sheard um, that I can go ahead and ask for, for the Q&A, unless you want to start with uh, Sorens and others. Why don't, you, why don't you do Tim? Let's maybe we can do a couple at a time for Jeremy, you know, give him a chance to, to kind of to dig in and synthesize as he will. Yeah, Lena, why don't you go yeah, first? Sure. Um, so his question is related to the, the voting rights bill legislation and negotiations that are going on right now. Um, so he's asking, um, what are your thoughts on the chances of passing the voting rights bill in the face of the Republican right taking over the machinery of voting and essentially creating a one party system? And where is the public outrage um, for the imminent danger that this is creating? Um, well, um, I think that the what we need to have done and we missed an opportunity to do it. Uh, and um, what we still need to do, but we're gonna have to figure out how to do it uh, is that we have to have a kind of popular mobilization uh, around the preservation of democracy uh, and the establishment, or let's say the establishment of democracy might be more accurate. Uh, and, um, uh, that is, uh, that's the, the fundamental balance of power around these issues uh, is at the moment not in our favor. That's also what we saw with the Build Back Better type uh, defeat of uh, Build Back Better and the inability of the Green New Deal uh, in spite of tremendous support uh, uh, and tremendous benefit to people. Uh, it's ability to get traction to a certain point and then not beyond that point. Um, and these are the result of a balance of power that involves, um, first of all, you know, over, overwhelming power on the part of those with wealth and power. Uh, and secondly, the mobilization of uh, uh, racial fears, identities, hatreds, uh, maybe especially fears in a way they're used to um, uh, prevent people from seeing and acting on their own interests. Uh, and what are in many ways their own values, uh, if you do poll data on values about dem democracy and everyone having the right to vote and stuff like that, it's overwhelming that there's popular support for those. The number of people who say, well, I don't believe black people should be allowed to vote is very, very small, but a manipulation of the situation has made it possible for that to occur. Uh, so, uh, and to, to maintain itself and to maintain itself even where you have Democratic Party majority in the all three, uh, uh, in the presidency and the Senate and the House. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I haven't heard this said, and I'm not enough of a political expert to say it, but um, if Joe Manchin suddenly got religion and uh, decided to back voting rights and back build back better, I'm not sure that the coal companies and uh, uh, leaders of the uh, uh, anti-civil rights, anti-voting rights movement wouldn't find another way of accomplishing the same objective. I mean, Manchin is just a, a power of convenience of, at the moment for them, uh, but they would 
probably find other ways. So my point is, I think if you had something that looked like um, uh, Black, Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter with 15 million people in the streets, you'd have a very different dynamic around the voting rights bill. Um, so let me, uh, you know, lots more could be said, but that's where I would start. Um, and I guess one more thing, because it's gonna be important as we go forward here, there was uh, a, a substantial uh, movement as the Trump coup became um, uh, more and more evident that that was what was gonna happen. There actually was a fairly substantial movement uh, to uh, try to protect the election. And a lot of plans for using direct action for that purpose. Um, and uh, uh, actually involved some unions along the way, um, uh, although whether they were actually prepared to do anything uh, or not was ambiguous. But um, uh, as soon as it became clear that Joe Biden had a big enough margin of victory um, that it would appear that he had one, it would be widely accepted that he had won, uh, or that's what they thought. Um, the Democratic Party leadership, Biden himself, completely pulled the rug out from under the mobilization to protect the election and said, go home and you know, forget about it. We'll take care of it. Um, we're going to face a similar situation. I think we're going to need a different set of, we're going to need a set of tactics that are not based on such dependence uh, on the existing political leadership. Um, and we're gonna, uh, there was a lot of very interesting good thinking that went on and propose, proposals and organizing and testing that went on in the lead up to uh, the last election. Um, you'll find some of it in my commentaries on the Labor Network for Sustainability website, uh, recounting the, some of the strategies that were developed at that point. Um, and I think we got to start thinking along those lines again. Um, so, okay, As, yeah, obviously there's more that could be said, but that's basically my view of it. Thank you, Jeremy. I have actually two questions uh, that have been written in the chat box and both authors have asked them to be relayed, Seren and Richard. And actually they, they kind of go together, they kind of dovetail a bit. So I'll do um, Seren's provocative uh, question first here. This is from Seren Mudliar, co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity. Seren writes, with huge, incredibly well-funded systems of organized disinformation and quote, cultivated ignorance, have we broken social movement? Uh, ha have we broken social movement feedback loops? So, f picking up on the the negative kind of or the 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 obstacles to to functional feedback loops in the terms of at the level of collective uh, action. Richard Bell asks uh, or asks you if you could comment on the rise of social media during your career in organizing and how it has changed what you think of as possible or whatever he thinks about the role of social media now. So two interesting questions of social media and, and cultivated organized disinformation and what they mean for social movements for better or worse. Jeremy? Um, both good questions and definitely related. Um, and uh, I, I would say um, the uh, blockading of uh, feedback loops and the preventing of people from learning from their experience and learning from what's going on in the world around them is uh, an absolutely central piece of uh, however you want to describe it, how the social order is maintained uh, or how people are prevented from getting uh, uh, an understanding of their world and conditions and therefore becoming empowered to act on those conditions. So it's, it's absolutely essential. Uh, I find it very difficult to uh, evaluate the different extent of that in different kinds of contexts. Uh, what came to my, uh, so I think it's definitely true that in 
our modern American experience, there is nothing like the Trump Fox News access uh, in terms of its ability to sit down every day and say, how are we going to pull the wool over people's eyes today? Or how are we going to arouse their emotions so that they support things and do things that are against their own interests? There's, you know, a big team out there that's every morning getting up and saying, okay, how are we going to do this today? Um, and uh, uh, there have always been teams like that, but we are facing a very high level of it. Um, uh, but uh, I also think what, what came to my mind with the question um, was the scene uh, in uh, 10 Days That Shook the World, the uh, uh, Eisenstein movie about the Russian Revolution, uh, in which the Bolshevik agitators uh, go out and meet the troops who are uh, of, uh, of the so-called whites who are coming in to suppress the revolution. And um, they are uh, peasants who are portrayed as um, a, a totally stupid, uh, dull, and uh, 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 totally uh, uh, embedded in the rule, intellectual rule of the priests and, uh, and of the Orthodox Church and its ability to totally shape their way of thinking uh, that's been maintained for um, uh, a thousand years at least. Um, and uh, so they would be a good example of people who have had their feedback loops broken. This may be may well be a stereotype that Eisenstein is uh, presenting, but it's certainly an image of people who have been cut off from the kinds of feedback loops that would uh, allow them to, that would support their developing another view. Um, the uh, Soviet agitators uh, have their newspaper with great huge type uh, on it and it says peace and these soldiers frown at them. And then it says bread. This is the Bolshevik slogan of the day. It says bread. And they look at one another and, well, yeah, we're interested in that. We're feeling awfully hungry. Uh, and then the third headline is land. And all of a sudden they break into these broad grins. And yeah, that's what they want. They want to be able to go back home and have the land and be able to cultivate it. And uh, uh, so all of this, so their view of, uh, but their expression, they haven't had any means of expressing that. But now that somebody has said, oh, we could talk about how are you going to get the land? There's a transformation of the situation. Obviously that's not the end of the story, um, but, uh, the uh, core, the core answer that I would give is, as I say, it's hard to evaluate one situation against another in terms of of this. But the the, the core, I tend to think in terms of strategies and what do you do about it under the under the circumstances you face. So trying to compare. You know, are people in one situation more oppressed or more uh, misled than in another situation? Uh, I'm not too good at that. I'm not sure how to do it, but I do have some ideas about when people are being misled. How do you go about breaking through and helping them figure out uh, another way to look at it? And uh, this points out some of the obvious ones, which is people have a problem. They're uh, they're uh, peasants. They're poor and either the, the landlords come and take their uh, all, uh, all of their uh, profit away or somebody's coming and taking their land away and uh, it, that's the gap that they're facing and if you can say here's something that might fill that gap or here's how you might begin developing something that could fill that gap that's how you go about um, uh, changing the situation and creating new feedback loops that allow people to see the next thing might be um, 
you know, well, that guy that's giving you the orders, is he a poor guy, man like you, or is he a uh, landlord, his family landlord, are they part of the people that are uh, exploiting you and preventing you from making a living on the land? And the uh, thick, allegedly thick uh, peasant might under those circumstances say, yeah, he's a rich guy, you know, uh, what's your point? Well, my point is maybe fighting for him isn't the way to go here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, it's, as you say, a process and understanding that process is what we need in order to get from here to there. Yeah, that's great. Lena's going to call on another question, another couple questions. I think she has one of her own. But I just, I just want to highlight again for everybody listening. You know that that last point I think I, I that you made, which is that idea that it's you know the way to get someone who might not be clued into the radical change we want to see to 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 see it isn't necessarily to like tell them they should change their fundamental goal, but see where they are already in whatever level, individual or collective coming up against the limit of the practice they're engaged with, right? And where there's a gap and thinking of ways to help develop uh, tools and strategies, new capacities to kind of fill some of that gap, right? And then in building that new capacity or in assisting people with that capacity, developing new relationship, new confidence, new understandings that might raise horizons about what's possible. I just think it's a I mean, it, it may be subtle, it may seem abstract to those who haven't been spending hours with the book, but I think it's it's really fundamental. It may also just be very organic and common sense to people that have been organizing. But I think the way you crystallize these concepts so that we can talk about them is, is very useful. And I hope that we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll radiate in all other kind of ways. Uh, enough from me, back to Lena and our, and our uh, audience. Yeah, um, so I just have a quick question. I'm really interested to hear about, um, I know that you've been involved with uh, Bernie Sanders campaign um, and working with him in DC. And I was interested to hear if you have any lessons that you've drawn from kind of, you know, the inside of electoral politics um, for the outside. Um, so yeah, that's my question. And then I'm gonna give it over to Mark Soderstrom. He also has a question. Um, well, Thank I you so much. Um, uh, your your first book, Strike, was a very influential book on me, and I'd just like to thank you personally for it. That book meant a lot, and it's a place where you are playing with sort of that horizontal self-organizational movement through workers' councils that you've continued here in, in common preservation. Um, and you wrote that in 1972, right, during the George Meaning years. Not exactly a happy time for horizontal self-organization but rather the height of bureaucratic and business unionism. Um, I'd be curious to sort of know your perspective at this point, looking back on more recent struggles in labor, right? The Chicago Teachers Union, sort of the radical caucus there coming to power and defeating Rahm Emanuel, or the more recent teachers strikes in West Virginia and Oklahoma, which even didn't necessarily have strong unions, or in Oakland, the nurses strike recently. Um, do you see sort of, are, do you have hope for the labor movement in terms of that kind of workers council movement that the, the sort of feedback loop and horizontal movements that you've praised in strike um, that sort of went on longer than I'd anticipated. Hopefully that made sense. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to have you see the connections between what's in strike and those ideas that you described there and 50 years later, common preservation, because it certainly is a, a thread that I've tried to develop and common preservation definitely grows out of those ideas, uh, as well as hopefully I've learned something at, uh, in the course of those 50 years. Um, uh, and I, in the course of the 50 years since I wrote strike, I've had the incredible privilege of revising the book uh, and especially updating it and adding to it uh, every decade or so since then. So I've actually had the opportunity to go back and pose the question that you're asking to myself and do research to try to figure out as best I can the answers to it. Uh, and in fact, there's a new edition that came out last year. It's a 50th anniversary edition of Strike. Uh, and uh, published by PM Press. Uh, and 
it has a, it's almost a mini book uh, on what I call the uh, uh, mini revolts of the 21st century. And it goes into a number of the ones you mentioned and some others, but uh, including a whole chapter on the teacher strikes uh, of the last three or four years and a section on uh, uh, the first wave of Black Lives Matter, got the book out before the second wave uh, and the uh, uh, other uh, uh, examples. Um, the women's uh, uh, march, which was maybe the biggest protest uh, up to that time in, in American history uh, and various others. Um, the statistics are in the book, you can look it up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, the, um, I, I do try to give an analysis of both what's remained the same uh, and what's changed. Uh, but I would say that the, the broad picture that it gives is that, uh, in fact, for various reasons, and if we had more time, we could go into them, but certainly globalization is a major factor that has weakened the ability of workers to use the strike as a means for uh, uh, exercising counter power on the job. Um, but there are other aspects of it too. But for, and for the variety of reasons, strikes have become, uh, in spite of the recent uptick, uh, very, very much less uh, used and much, much harder to use effectively uh, as a means of counter power, as a means of uh, um, uh, the, pow the powerless expressing power vis-a-vis -vis their employers. Uh, that may not be forever. Uh, there may be other uh, strategies and tactics um, that gen broadly speaking are, are, could be described as strikes, um, but uh, under the conditions that have existed uh, really for the last 40 years, um, the ability of workers to use the strike as a vehicle uh, has been severely undermined. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the 21st century has seen, the last 20 years or so, has seen uh, what um, uh, I describe as many revolts, which are uh, upheavals that usually involve, you know, millions of people, <laughs> they're not that small, uh, but, uh, and sometimes include some strikes as part of the tactical armamentarium, but that also involve uh, all kinds of other confrontations and direct action. Um, and um, I would go on and obviously talk about it for a long time, but I'll have to tell you to go look at the book instead. Uh, but that, I think that that's the big shift. Uh, and these, but these movements, I would say, are even more self-organized, uh, more utilizing direct action power uh, uh, than much of the labor movement has been. And they also, one other thing is I should, I should say that they very, very often involve a collaboration, uh, undoubtedly with tension in a lot of cases, but cooperative uh, mutual support between organized institutional forces, especially the organized labor and much more Lucy goosey uh, self-organized, non-institutionalized uh, 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 forces. Um, so there's tension in that, but there's also a lot of the power of those actions has come from that uh, collaboration. And also, Lena had a question about the Barry, uh, the Bernie Sanders experience and the uh -huh. inside outside uh, strategy <laughs> that you uh, experienced there. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, first of all, let me say, I think in terms of the uh, American political system that Bernie Sanders has been the most positive uh, uh, kind of force uh, in terms of political leadership 
that we've had, uh, I'm gonna say not only in the last decades, but in my lifetime. Uh, so having said that, uh, I, needed, I questioned whether I should um, go into my actual experience uh, with Bernie Sanders or not, uh, but um, uh, I decided that I should uh, with that introduction. Uh, so um, when the uh, Clinton administration decided to um, bomb Yugoslavia and went to the uh, Congress for authorization to do so, uh, Bernie supported it and I quit. <laughs> so um, that I think that uh, uh, it illustrates, my rap illustrates both the fact that he has played a tremendously positive role and the fact that if you're somebody that has, uh, that wasn't read, wasn't bred up to bomb civilians, uh, there was a limit. Uh, I think it was a rare uh, exception in his case also, he said. I was shocked by it because when I joined his staff, one of the reasons I felt okay about it was that he um, had, uh, uh, had quite a consistent record of opposing American military operations abroad. Uh, and, um, so I was actually quite taken aback. Uh, but when I originally went to work with him, I had anticipated um, the possibility of this kind of thing. And I said to my friends, uh, well, what am I gonna do if he starts bombing some of his people in some country? Um, and the answer that everyone said, oh, go ahead and work for him. If he does that, you can just quit. And so uh, I quit. <laughs> and you're here to tell the tale. All right. Uh, so I think Lena has one final question. We are past 830 and uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up soon, I think. But Lena has one more question, I think, for you, which should be of interest to all. Yeah, Lena? Yeah. Um... So this has been such a great conversation. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and I think you've already illuminated so many valuable means and strategies for, you know, building power and solidarity. Um, so I just have kind of a question to conclude uh, the interview um, by asking just kind of what are what your hopes are with this book and um, what you're hoping the book will make um, in terms of its contribution to how activists and organizers operate um, as we're going forward? The, uh, I, I'm not the kind of person who feels like, well, you write a book and it tells everyone what to do and what to think. And you're, my greatest aspiration is that people will do exactly what I told them to do. Um, my aspiration for the book is that people, uh, first of all, that it will find an audience among people who have a serious interest in what the heck are we gonna do about the situation that um, uh, we're facing? Uh, I would like it to be a book that was cherished by the look up crowd, as opposed to the don't look up crowd. Um, and uh, the, uh, that uh, people who read it, um, will argue with it uh, and think about what they think it's got wrong and will make their own synthesis of what the book says and what they think that's better than the book. So that's, uh, uh, and I also hope uh, that it will be something that people can use. Uh, you know, we read books usually as an individual and. Uh, think about it and you know we might argue with it but we argue with the book uh, but I would uh, very much hope that it's something that people who want to make change who want to fight climate change who want to find new avenues to uh, freedom and liberation for oppressed peoples um, will discuss with each other and especially with, when they're facing a situation, uh, well, what are we gonna do about, let's take the uh, uh, question that was raised, 
what are we going to do about the Voting Rights Act and about the uh, elimination of uh, the right to vote um, and the unfortunate uh, looming problem of broader uh, denials of democracy. Um, uh, my fondest hope would be that people who were struggling with that question and wanted to act on it would take this and say, well, let's see, let's try applying this heuristic to that problem. And um, let's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try, try it out. It's some, some of the ideas will probably be totally useless for our purpose, but let's see if we can get anything out of it that'll help us uh, in addressing the problems we face. That's great, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I want to say I, I can't speak for the all of Shelter and Solidarity. We've never done a book club, but I personally would definitely be in to have a discussion uh, with you know with people who have read the book or sections of it uh, in person or here in a Zoom space to dig into it because I think it is a it is a uh, you mentioned earlier about trying to help us get a paddle. Well, I, mean, I don't know if you've given us a paddle, but you've given us, as you say, a whole toolbox, a tool chest. Um, a, a tool shed of, of methods and concepts that I think are very much not about telling people what to do, but helping people to analyze and interact with their own situation, to investigate and formulate and, and, and act on the gaps and problems around them. Uh, and I think it's, it's really, really well done. I'm just so glad we could have you here this evening, Jeremy. Thanks again for joining us on Shelter and Solidarity. And thanks to PM Press too for co-sponsoring this. Um, I want to just wrap up here um, with a few little boilerplate we have here at Shelter and Solidarity. The show wouldn't have been possible without the SNS production team, including Lena Durkin. Lena, it's been great hosting with you this evening. Yes, you too. Thank you so um, much. Joe. Also, Linda Liu, Kira Mudliar, Seren Mudliar, Rachel Yarshas Patton, Joe Ramsey, Tim Sheard, who just hopped off, but he's, uh, it was good to see Tim tonight, and Mark Soderstrom. SNS Shelter and Solidarity ho hosts at least a monthly, sometimes twice a month, Thursday evening show. You can find us at shelterandsolidarity.org, shelterandsolidarity.org, as well as on YouTube with our Shelter and Solidarity channel. We also have a Saturday show, a Saturday bookshelf, which you can look for. Um, we have exciting shows coming up, a whole 2022 lineup assembling for you, uh, which I will not reveal right now, but check our website, check our Facebook page, and stay subscribed so you don't miss an episode. You can also watch the back episodes, the archival shows on